the one that's back to it. And uh, Menorah, first time he's won over three miles at Weatherby. We've never won the Charlie Hall before, so great start with both. Gives you um, a conundrum, which, as you say, is a bit of a surprise at this stage, particularly of Menorah's career, because suddenly he's winning over three miles or an extended three miles, potentially, assuming the distance was right. Where do you go now? Because we didn't necessarily think of Menorah as a, a, an out-and-out three-miler, but now perhaps he is, is he? I think probably his best for it's two miles six. But having said that, the, the King George definitely becomes unlikely, I'd say. Whereas the Betfair chase at Haydock, probably the ground will be very soft, which it usually is, and it might not be ideal. So he, he could be running in the King George. And if he, if he does, then he could presumably run against Captain Chris if he comes back for the King George. And he could well do. We have to decide with Captain Chris in the next week or two which route we're going to take. He um, has well documented that he uh, got a tendon problem uh, or a suspensory problem, not the flexor tendon, the suspensory problem after he uh, won the Ascot chase in February. And it's surprising how well it's, it's uh, um, mended. Uh, ben Brain scanned him a few times. Annabelle King or Murphy, Annabelle Murphy, when, she, when he was there, he was doing the counting work and everything. Been back here a few weeks. His legs look up to the A1. So the King George becomes a possible. We have the view now about Captain Chris, surprisingly, given that he won an arc, or that he needs to go right-handed. Is that very much the case or not? Uh, it's always been the case, even before he won the Arkle. Uh, um, he, he's always jumped right-handed, even in his first ever hurdle race he did. And we've had lots of vets and physios and everybody look at him, no progress whatsoever. So... Um, He's just a much better horse going right-handed because he naturally does jump right. Uh, going left-handed at Cheltenham, he's wasting a lot of ground. Even when he won the Arkle, he was going badly right. So we've got Captain Chris hopefully coming back. We've got wishful thinking and Menorah already off the mark. And I suppose looking at the, that trio, maybe this is the year where all three of them deliver the goods all season. Well, I suppose they're all three getting older, so it's probably unlikely, but you never know. Pretty good year if they do, though. From, from, from your point of view, I mean, it, you could shoot at a lot of big prizes with that trio. Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, realistically, you say the most classy of the three is definitely Cutting Chris, really. Um, and a gold cup would be a possibility for him. But again, going left hand is not ideal. So therefore, you know, the three mile chase in Punchtown is probably a more likely long term part target. Of course, all this success should come as no surprise. Hobbs has been training top-class jumpers from his home base near Minehead for a good many years. Well, we started training here in 1985, um, and the first year we were training, I still had my riding licence, so I had 12 months of still with a riding licence when we were training as well. So we started here with six horses um, at that stage on the farm here, which is a rented farm. It's at Crown Estate where we are. Philip Hobbs is from a farming family. I asked him whether that farmer's stockman's eye was a crucial part of his armoury as a trainer. Having done it for a long time, a lot of it is just common sense. If a horse is healthy and well and you're working him hard and he's sticking the work and he's fit and there's no obvious signs of anything amiss with the horse, then in my opinion you don't want to be looking for things that are wrong by taking blood tests or scopes or anything else. If everything's going right, run him, you know. And you're not going to win races unless you run horses. I mean, we we can always find reasons not to run them, but if you can't find any obvious reason not to run them, don't look for them. Favouring common sense is sometimes a shorthand for mistrust of modern ways. I wondered whether Hobbs shared his near neighbour Martin Pipe's fascination with the scientific testing of his horses. Obviously it's been well documented that the, the pipes um, apply a lot of science. Uh, that's very well, but they've got lots of good common sense too. So, you know, look, it's a combination of things, isn't it? Hobbs was quick to admit, though, that it's not the case that there was nothing to learn from the legendary Martin Pipe, and he confessed to a surreptitious visit to the great man's gallops at night. I think it was 1986, I think, yeah. Um, Sarah and myself, one evening, once it was getting dark, we knew there'd be nobody on the gallops. We went and measured up, particularly their, their schooling hurdles on the gallop, actually, or whatever. Anyway, I told Martin about... 10 or 15 years later and he sent me an email said he was going to sue me but but I, I, he, he always joked about it but um, it's never happened yet. I, I love going around the trainers yards and, and always have done and uh, there's always things to be um, to be learned that way. Um, we go to Mark Prescott's yard every year in June July and he comes down here in November so um, it, it's, all, it's always um, it's always very interesting to, um, to to see other people and the way they do things which varies enormously but as long as horses are fit and healthy then hopefully they'll produce the best. Most of Hobbs big guns have already started to fire but what of Fingal Bay? 
He enjoyed a great hurdling campaign, but he hasn't been seen over fences since running out at Exeter. First of all, he's in very good form. Secondly, he's had four seasons and he's always won first time out. So that's what we're going to have to do, go straight to the Hennessy. It wasn't the plan originally, but we're going to have to go straight there now. Thirdly, he's running three chases. First two at Chepstow and Cheltenham. He jumped brilliant, one at Chepstow, second at Cheltenham. Um, still can't have any idea what happened to Exeter, really. I mean, he, he jumped by badly one way and eventually he ran out um, and, he's, and, he, and he'd uh, hurt his tendon after that, which wasn't due to... That wasn't the reason that he was performing so badly on the day. So no idea. And look, he's come back since then. He's been a Cheltenham Festival winner since then, so seems good. He won the Per Temps final, of course, at Cheltenham, which was quite some feat in itself. Was it a conundrum for you whether to stay hurdling or go chasing, or was it always the plan that he'd be going back over fences? Um, uh, sort of. Um, after the Per Temps race, we went to Punchdown. In the, he ran one in the grade one over there, three-mile condition hurdle where he finished fifth or sixth, ran well, but realistically, I thought it showed that he's not at that level over hurdles. So therefore, we have to consider the other option, that he might be at that level over fences. So the Hennessy is an ideal starting point. Given what he looked like doing when he was starting out over fences, and given that he's good, good enough to do what he did over hurdles, can we think that maybe he could be even better as a chaser? Because he was a chaser, so could he be even better than he's shown so far back over fences? Uh, he certainly could be, and that's why we're sort of thinking of the Hennessy first before we go to other things afterwards, but um, I hope he can be, yeah. Having started by talking about the trio of Waitley-owned superstars, I asked Philip if there was another three up-and-coming stars in the same colours waiting in the wings. Well, we hope so. Guy of Vitoire is very good, um, still improving, hopefully. Rock the Casbar won well at uh, Fontmore the other day. Um, he's won two out of his three races so far. Um, and Duke Deschamps won his first ever bumper the other day at Chepso, could be a very nice horse. And they've got a lot of young horses that haven't even run yet. I'm sure none of them, some of them will be uh, not any good, but um, there might be some stars there too. One thing that must strike every visitor to the Sandhill Yard is how settled, happy and efficient the staff there is. British and Irish voices prevail, and everyone seems genuinely happy to be there. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Without a happy ship, you won't have happy horses either, will you? You know, and the whole thing's, um, you know, very much um, overseen by Johnson White, who's been here for a long time as our assistant, and um, it, he keeps the whole show, show running with the organisation of the uh, the staff, and um, that's very, very important. Without, without the right team of staff, you've got absolutely no chance training the horses. I mean, besides uh, Johnson, you know, we've got the travelling head lads that go to the race with the horses. We have the two head girls who. Um, um, Lisa and Carol, who've both been here a very long time, who are in charge of half the horses each. Um, so they, they deal with any issues with the horses, any bandaging, um, sorting out problems, uh, to discuss with them whether we need the best, etc. Um, all, all these things are vital to keep the whole operation um, running correctly. It's hard to imagine Philip Hobbs anywhere else than training on the land where he was born and bred. I asked him if this intimate connection to this particular place was important to him? Uh, yeah, massively so. First of all, staff, we have 35 staff here. Um, secondly, when I uh, finished race riding, I actually wanted to start in Lamont because I'd lived there for some time, or just up the road in Ashbury. And, uh, and um, I was keen to start there, but um, luckily I couldn't afford it. And I suppose, you know, I stopped riding when I was 30. At that stage, you know, uh, you, you you don't feel the roots are so important. Now I do. My mother's family particularly have lived around this area for the last 200 years. So, and uh, I, I have a, a um, my uncle is only 10 years older than me, farms on the next door farm here, a Crown Estate farm as well. Um, and I've got, you know, we've got other relations and lots of good friends in the area. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't move from here now, that's for sure. I mean, I, mean, I would have done, but, but I wouldn't now. I wouldn't even consider it. So Philip Hobbs is clearly of this place, but what about the place? Is the rural way of life, which underpins national hunt racing, under threat? Um, to some extent. I mean, you know, we've had the hunting issue recently, um, things, I mean, uh, which isn't great. I mean, the Devons and Somerset stag hounds are a very important part of the community around here, and now they can only hunt with two hounds. And uh, Donald's, Donald Summersgill, the huntsman there, comes here most Fridays to see horses work. Um, and, and, it, and, and it's a great part of the community here. And, you know, the hunting obviously now has to go on under different rules as does the fox hunting in the area but all that sort of thing brings the rural community together and there are you know lots of things raised 
to raise money for the hunts, um, which otherwise a lot of these people wouldn't even see each other. So yeah, all those sorts of things are important, you know? Yeah. yeah. Does that ever frustrate you that perhaps those of us, perhaps people like me sitting in our studios covering horse racing are perhaps a little bit unaware of the connection between that way of life and the hunting tradition, all, all that goes with it, and horse racing? Yeah, um, but it's not a disadvantage just to us that you maybe you're in your studio and to, to, totally understand what goes on in the background. Um, I do wonder sometimes, actually, I was talking to Johnson about this the other day, I, I do think any racing journalist should just spend a week in a yard just following us around, seeing all the problems we have and how things work. Because the questions we are asked sometimes, they have got no idea. And that's why Tom Ryan's so good, you know, because he was a jockey himself and, and understands what might happen, you know. What's the biggest issue there, that people just don't no, realise what's going just on? I just ask the most stupid questions sometimes, you know. <laughs> Maybe Which I'll... to me is stupid because it's to me it's common sense. Obviously it's not common sense if you haven't done it. But just, even if just they spent a week in a yard, they would begin to understand a bit how things work. Well, maybe I'll take you up on that. And you, you, could, you, could spend a, you could spend an afternoon in the studio if you fancy. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome to come here for a week if you like.